Well, thank you for coming on this beautiful afternoon. I mean, midwinter warmth like this. It's hard to give up, but you've given it up. And I want to thank you for that and for inviting me here um, to really, in a way, probe, open ourselves to the crisis that we are in, yeah. undoubtedly in crisis on our beautiful planet. And to open ourselves to the possibility that a great healing may also lie inside that crisis. That's certainly the way that I, I see it. I don't say it's the only possible outcome. There are many, and some of them are horrific, ahead of us as possibilities. But what I want to suggest is that inside a crisis there really is, first of all, a potential for not knowing so much. A crisis is like an interruption to business as usual. It is, a, it is the disruption that allows us to see what business as usual actually looks like. So to the extent that um, we're now at a place where it's not a simple, uh, we can no longer simply assume, we can simply, you know, we can go on, the world will be a little bit like it was for us, for our children, and so on. Instead, we're approaching the possibility that there will be little or no habitable or at least amenable world for our, our descendants. We're living in a place in time that suddenly appears shallow. And that's a very strange thing, I think, for human beings. I think we have always taken it for granted that there is continuity way behind us and way in front of us. And now we can't assume that because we have, in a sense, stepped out of the continuity of the, that the terms of the earth invite us into. So in a way, I want to um, put it to us, all of us, that the earth right now is asking us to discover what the terms of the earth are and to let us rediscover <coughs> humanity in the light of that, because I think we've barely grazed it so far. Even the great religions of the earth <coughs> have only to a limited extent taken on the fullness of this great question that is now being posed by the earth. And I think any, any world religion that does not address this question right now is fast losing its youth by date. So, and I say this about the place from which my own religious practice comes, and that's a Buddhist background, I'm a Zen teacher. I do not see in Buddhist countries a remarkable <coughs> preservation of the earth or a great deep accord with the terms of the, of the earth. I do not see ecological mind, even though I can find it implicit in certain aspects of, of Buddhist thinking. And to the extent that Buddhist thinking has a degree of kinship with indigenous mind, and it does have quite a strong one, that's where I begin to see some kind of productive interface um, and, and in a way inspiration for what, what kind of thinking can unfold. But when I look at the great religions of the book, I see, and, and remembering that they all arise in a post-agricultural, to some extent post-urban or beginning of urban mind as well. And all of them reflect some measure of a sense of exile from earth, some measure of being, in a sense, out of harmony, that the human being is in a distressingly, I guess you could say, incongruous relationship with the earth. Um, I use that word deliberately because I recently came across the words of Paulo Freire, some people will know, I'm sure, his name. Paulo Freire was a, a great um, social theorist and educator. He's, he was most well known for his book, A Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And notice, mm. it's not a pedagogy for the oppressed, it's a pedagogy of, one that grows organically out of. Conversation, immersion in the lives of deeply oppressed people. A pedagogy arises, and the genius of that pedagogy arises from that engagement for him. And he was really influenced by um, 
a number of movements at the time, um, including the liberation of theology in Latin America. But anyway, when Paulo Freire was close to death, <coughs> somebody asked him, what is most important? It's always a good question to ask someone who's close to that point where they can not just look back, but in a sense lean forward into the complete unknown. And he said, the beautiful daily struggle to be congruent. And I found that a very inspiring kind of, um, almost a koan in a sense. I will be talking about koans as we go, but partly it has a bit of that feel because it says that the struggle is both beautiful and daily. And to say beautiful struggle is already to sort of bring two things into conjunction that start to undo our ideas about either of them. And to be congruent. It also, of course, immediately opens up the great question, congruent with what? And we may find each of us you know, very different responses arising in ourselves to that question, congruent with what? What is it that we find the best of ourselves appearing when we actually enter a beautiful daily struggle? to be congruent with whatever it is, the deepest, freshness, deep down thing, whatever, for each of us. But surely it also includes the earth. The earth gave us everything, everything we are. Every, it gave us our minds, it gave us, you know, you could almost say that already in the, in the rocks of this earth, this planet, was the music of Mozart, not to mention Birdsong, not to mention the mind of a human being that can reflect on and, in a sense, reflect entirely in the whole universe. And actually, the mind and the universe, the mind and earth, what is the degree of congruence? And remember that the word congruent, from a geometry point of view, is talking about two things that exactly fit each other. They fit upon each other, one fits <coughs> the other in terms of you can overlay one congruent shape on another and the first one disappears entirely into the second. So there is that. Of course, congruence is also talking about harmony, harmony and fit and things meeting beautifully and mutuality, I think. Two things that are deeply mutual, that imply each other profoundly. So from a Zen point of view, the sense, the question that the mind and the earth may be congruent, may be in fact almost impossible to take apart, to tell apart at a certain level, is a fairly natural kind of assumption for me to make. And I hope that by the end of the afternoon, we might, I might be able to make that accord with you as well, in some measure. So, <clears throat> we live at a time when we have to sort of somehow hold in one mind such things as the collapse of the West Antarctic ice shelf, I, I had vast amount of water being, you know, in a sense, about to be unleashed into the ocean, and very daily concerns when I have to pick up the children, what I have to do, where, you know, very, very ordinary things like that, which press make their immediate pressure felt. So we have, we have this almost impossible proposition that all that is happening and is slowly apparently becoming impossible to pretend is not happening has to be held in the same mind as a time, apparently we're all time poor. How that came about is impossible to say because there's exactly as much time as there was. <laughs> <laughs> And at the same time also, you know, to be able to hold our hearts and not turn away from the huge things happening on our earth that have our fingerprints all over them. Our daily fingerprints all over them, because it's what we do every day that is creating what is happening every day in, in this large scale form. The most minute things we do and the largest things that are happening are all one thing. So it's 
quite an extraordinary moment, you know, from one point of view, a terrible, terrifying kind of moment. But I don't know how useful terror is. It doesn't seem all that productive politically or socially. It seems to be a way, in fact, to reduce people to helplessness, to actually create walls in the mind instead of allowing those walls to soften and, and fall away, which is a, a wonderful way of understanding what not knowing might be. But I will be returning to this question of not knowing. I do remember once attending um, what Helen Caldercock called her bombing run. This was when Helen was abroad a lot, and she was, at, at gatherings like this, she would present what would happen at ground zero if a bomb exploded in a nuclear explosion, Sydney? What would happen five kilometers out? What would happen 10 kilometers out and so on? And it was both meant to be terrifying and while was terrifying. I remember going home and looking at a map and saying exactly what coming kind of kilometers what <laughs> from the center of Sydney. <laughs> and were my children safe enough there? Could we survive? But I don't think that a bombing run actually produces either congruence or courage. I think it has a strong possibility, in fact, of almost making the topic of what's happening with our planet global warming, but not simply global warming, everything that is feeding uh, the disaster, the catastrophe, the absurd catastrophe of many of these, these infinitely subtle climate settings become trashed by a kind of indifference, a kind of rapacious indifference, if you can have such a thing. Um, so there's, there's a sense of um, a possibility that that's not the way to go, that in fact it creates a taboo, and we can't turn in that direction, or we become paralyzed if we look at it, it's like the Gorgon, we can't look at it, go. we become paralyzed. So we don't look at it. We look at the immediate things we're doing that day, even while the West Antarctic ice shelf is steadily falling away. So this is our strange, interesting, and possibly highly productive situation. It's a little bit like um, we're in a strange place where which in the novel Moby Dick, there's a moment when Captain Ahab um, is speaking about the great white whale that is his nemesis, his, his alter ego in a way, the, the thing that must destroy him because his ego destroys everything. <laughs> so what he says at a certain point to his men, and it's a, side, a sideways sort of comment, he's not trying to explain himself, but he accidentally explains himself entirely. He says, all my means are sane. That is, you know, I've got the right equipment to get the whale, I've got the ship, I've got, I know roughly where the whale is. I know I'm going to get it, I've got the technology, blah, blah, blah. All my means are sane. My motives and my object, wholly mad. <laughs> now that's a, a wonderful presentation of the disjunction we're in right now, I think where the kinds of decisions that are made make perfect sense economically, <coughs> they make perfect sense in terms of profit, they make perfect sense in terms of the immediate steps to be taken with something. Like, for example, the everyday tomato. I do talk about this in, in one of the chapters of my book, the way that the North American tomato started off as a genetically patented hybrid derived from a, from a a, t a Mexican strain that was once growing on land owned by Mexicans, farmers. That new strain, however, the genetically patented hybrid, um, has a very low con tolerance for its, its local conditions, as they were in Mexico. <coughs> so the land has to be fumigated with an intensely poisonous um, ozone-depleting chemical, methyl bromide by name, and it's then doused in pesticides. That's the first of the motives wholly sane. Oh, sorry, my means being wholly sane. My motives and my object hold that. Because it goes on that the toxic waste from these chemicals is then shipped 
to one of the largest chemical dumps all the way over in Alabama, which happens to be a black, poor black neighborhood with very, poor, very, very marked effects on mental health. Meanwhile, the Mexican farm workers have been, all been displaced from their traditional cooperatives, but they are permitted to apply the pesticide to the tomato <coughs> on what was once their farmland, but they're given no instructions in, in proper ways to do this, no protection, no health care, and they're paid around $2.50 a day. So again, this makes great sense in terms of the company that is, is overseeing this operation, but the motives and the object of this are wholly mad. They continually go on to destroy more and more and more. It goes on in that they are placed on those polystyrene styrofoam trays, covered in plastic wrap, then packed in cardboard boxes. Each of these elements are manufactured all over the United States in different places and transported to, to the site at huge expense of, of fossil fuel. The cardboard boxes were once 300-year-old trees harvested from an old-growth forest in British Columbia, manufactured thousands of miles distant from that in the Great Lakes District, and then shipped by truck all the way back to Latin American farms using oil, extracted and processed in Mexico. I won't go on because you can begin to see all of this whole process is leading to, well, to what? To an almost tasteless, hopeless, unrecognizable, pathetic piece of fruit, well, having almost no relationship any further, any, no, any, in any way now to what we once would have called a tomato. If you grow your own tomatoes, you know what I'm talking about because the difference is like two different plants, the fruit of two different kinds of plants. So we're left, we're left with this great incongruity, this sense of exile or of being, sometimes I think of it as we're becoming almost autistic as a species. We have almost no connection with other species apart from our pet animals and our affection for certain birds, perhaps. We have, our children are having less and less immediate contact with just ordinary things like mud and grass and, and fallen logs. I once watched a little party of school children running down the hillside. They came to a fallen log and they didn't know what to do next. <laughs> they didn't know you could climb up on it and then jump off it, for example. They sort of waved their hands around. In other words, they had almost no contact with the earth. Many children are raised, you know, 30 stories above the earth now in, in apartments. They, their life is lived on screen. How do we get our children break the screen back into the real world? You know, they're in a kind of looking glass world. And if they can't get back into the world, will they be able to fall in love with it? Will they actually know that the earth is something of profound love. I don't know that they will, and this is a terrifying possibility. I don't know if you saw the ABC program, recently a documentary series on the Great Barrier Reef, that was three or four documentaries. I saw one of them. I don't have television, but on iView I tuned in and I saw, just, I was so moved by something I saw. It was a moment when I actually must mention I grew up next to the Great Barrier Reef and spent a lot of my childhood floating above it in amazement, <laughs> looking down. And <clears throat> I saw um, some fish collectors. They were collecting really exquisite, beautiful fish, the sort of fish that are unimaginable until the moment you see them. They just, you couldn't drink them up. And they were being collected for aquariums mm -hmm. and for sale but also for public aquariums. And at first, I just felt, this is horrible. These fish are going to be put into a most limited and, and sadly um, impoverished world from where they are now. And then the person who was collecting them said what he was doing with this. He said, look, we have to, we have to actually do this so that people can see them and fall in love with them. He said, if we, people, if we don't fall in love with the reef, we can't save it. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a sort of shock, a secondary shock in that for me, which is the shock almost of how do you manage to be not in love with the rain? <laughs> and with the earth? How, how do you manage that? Is it possible? We have to actually <clears throat> take on the possibility that that might not be a natural consequence in the way it naturally is or should be. So somehow, um, <clears throat> somehow there's, a, there's an intimate relationship between the extreme vulnerability of the way the Earth is now positioning us, you might say, and the kind of question it's asking of us. The extreme vulnerability of the Earth and of us are very linked. The extreme vulnerability and the possibility of a discovery of a new degree of resilience and congruence. These two things are intimately linked. Um, in the book I, I talk about the, the very moment um, where in a way this book began. And it was when I was about 12 years old, I think. <clears throat> and my brother and sister and I were sitting around late at the kitchen table after we'd eaten a meal on our own. The three of us were together. My, I was the youngest, my sister and then my brother. Each of us exactly two years apart in this fashion of those days. And family planning was very precise. <laughs> and, um, and we started to talk about what was happening in the world at that time. All of, each of us, a different measure, were aware of the things like the limits to growth was being talked about, Paul Ehrlich, population explosion, Silent Spring, all of these things were in the air. And the sense of, even of, of global warming was not, not being talked about. It was being talked about as early as you know, six six or more decades ago, and on this occasion, um, this conversation went on until about three in the morning. We just sort of began to look at the avalanche of extinctions that was already underway, and the sense that, you know, the things that are so intrinsic to our sense of being human in a world like this were all being sort of torn away or being allowed to drop away. Um, tigers, for example. I mean, tigers make humans human. Tigers, among other things, have made us human. We've learned our humanness from all of the various forms of sentience that this earth is composed of. Um, if you think of the tigerish quality, you know immediately what that is, because you, you've taken that in. We know the sentience. Um, we dream our way into the sentience of, of other creatures because they're so beautiful, they're so remarkable. And the idea that tigerness could be allowed to vanish from the earth was appalling. It is an appalling proposition, among many other appalling propositions. Anyway, so this was a very painful conversation, and I remember feeling exhilarated at one level because we were taking on such big things together and also crushed and by the burden of it, by the sense that the weight of this was so great. What on earth do you do with it? What could be done about this? What there's always a sense of someone has to do something. Who what can I do? This someone. Let's just find the someone <laughs> who can do it. And of course it doesn't come down to someone except this one. It, every single one of us is the someone. So I went to bed with this sense of having taken on some of the weight of the world and this way that made me feel bigger and, and scared and enlarged all at once. And then in the morning I came down to the same place, same kitchen table, and put down my bowl of cereal and sat at the table, pulled up the same chair, sat at the same place. And the moment I did that, full of all of these sort of shards of, you know, destructive feelings. This huge wave of something else rolled through me and it was a, an overwhelming sense of, I guess you could say it's almost like those, those words 
of, of is it Hildegard or Julian of Norwich, who said, all sport is well and all manner of things are well. That was absolutely um, impossible to take apart from the feeling of huge vulnerability. <laughs> the two came together. And I think also the sense that my brother and sister and I had dared to face these huge things together. Um, I mean, people who love each other, facing it together. I don't think these things are disconnected. I think they, they have to, we have to find, you know, what is the story here about mutuality? What is the story here about love? Can we understand our relationship to the earth as one of mutual love? Can we dare to do that rather than seeing the natural world as something that must be held at a careful, carefully adjusted distance at every point? And everything that comes with the natural world, you know, our mortality. The fact that we, we may grow sick and, and, and have a hard time, that we will suffer at times, that rather more than geological events, geophysical events may happen, that they can hold up for a while. These things are also within the frame of um, a sense of something we might call love, or at least if if it's if it could be seen as simply, if you want to use a more neutral word, con profound congruence that can be rediscovered and constantly, daily reconstructed, rediscovered and, and in a sense sustained. <clears throat> a Zen teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who some people might have heard of, a Vietnamese teacher, Nobel Prize winner, um, Peace Prize winner, Thich Nhat Hanh spoke of having what he called a deep conversation with the earth. But he, by that he would really mean a kind of deep, reflective, meditative encounter with some deep questions. And the first, and the first question was a question he said he asked of the earth, which is, can I rely on you? Because after all, there's a, it's not hard to feel at the moment that we push the earth so hard, the retaliation might be very terrible to encounter. Can I rely on you? And even in this deep question, the, 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 the mutuality, the mutual reflection of human mind and earth, earth and human mind, the earth not just not only gave rise to the human mind, the human mind and the earth are are so connected now, even in the most direct and physical ways. We know now that we're, we're in a time, a geological time, where we cannot um, take ourselves out of the equation in the sense that, for example, more Earth is moved on the surface of the Earth each year now by human beings than by natural forces more Earth is displaced and pushed around and, and <coughs> than by glaciation and wind and water and, and, and temperature change and so on. That's quite a remarkable thing. Um, and of course, uh, we're now mutual in a way, co-creators of the very climate settings of the Earth. So this this mutuality is, is a very profound matter, and in, from one point of view, um, it's, it's something to really, I think, grow deeply interested in and, and reassured by. Um, we cannot actually step outside uh, the terms of the earth. We may dream we can, we can and there's this terrible dreams of, terrible dreams of, um, Geoengineering that are, are dawning now in certain minds, um, including Bill Gates, who's a very strong investor in geoengineering possibilities. The idea, for example, of seeding the atmosphere with with various kinds of particles that will reflect light and heat back from the atmosphere, with only the small price to pay that instead of a blue sky, it will have a brown sky. <coughs> 
Um, so what happens when we look deeply into this, this question of the mutuality is, is something like the Thomas Berry. I know a lot of people here know and love Thomas Berry. And in The Dream of the Earth, he, he spoke for many things, but one of the things he said that struck me most deeply was this. He said, this, meaning this reality we are in, is not a collection of things. And that has been, and that remains, the very strong contention of the mindset that is abroad on our earth right now. The, you could say, the technologized, science-based, and I have no argument with science itself, but science has, at least in its earlier stages, was very much focused on seeing the earth and everything in it as things that could be, you could do things with, and test the limits of, and discover the properties of, and, and isolating, in a sense, carving not just everything in the universe up into, into dividedness, but carving us out of the universe at the same moment mm -hmm. with our minds, our minds being you know, not part of this inextricable whole. So Thomas Frey said, this is not a collection of things. It is a communion of subjects. That's such a huge uh, shift of ground. It's the same, it's actually the ground we're standing on, but now we see it in a totally different light, I think. So the word communion, you know, it, it's, it goes even deeper than the word conversation. In communion, there is a sense of discovering each other, ourselves in the other, of taking the other in completely as a sort of sacred fact. You know, my life is also your life. That's the mutuality implied here. And communion of subjects means that, you know, you don't leave oceans and rivers and mountains and glaciers and tigers and, and splendid blue wrens or anything else out of this communion of subjects. Human beings, as I argue in my book, are like the Earth's best creation so far in terms of a collecting point of sentience. Human being, our minds, are like so responsive to the sentience of other beings, so able to sort of drink that in and, and in a way discover ourselves inside the other. I don't know about you, but if I watch a splendid blue wren, I, I'm very drawn into <laughs> the mind and being of a, either a splendid blue wren or one of their dowdy, supposedly dowdy, brilliant little wives that <laughs> rush this jump cut from one point to another and you know they're, they're marvels, they're marvels. And clouds are marvels. There's nothing really that does not invite us to explore the sense of what this mind is in a deeper and ever deeper sense. Dogen Kigen, who is a 13th, uh, 11th century, sorry, 13th century Japanese, no, 11th century, 11th century Japanese Zen master, said, I came to see that mind is no other than the mountains and rivers, the great earth, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase, and uh, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Mind and all that mind can hold <clears throat> ultimately cannot be told apart. And this is the place that um, I think we either are going to reach towards you know, in our beautiful, perhaps stumbling, fumbling, and, and um, failing at times uh, daily struggle to be congruent. This is where it is drawing us. I think where the earth, by posing this great crisis, is asking us to step up in a new way as human beings. Um, Thomas Berry also speaks about the moment when he calls it a random childhood memory. Um, the thing that, in a way, inspired him to rename himself from being a theologian to being a geologian, I love that fact, he, he really said that, um, that there's 
really no way to be a theologian or anymore. If you can't extend that into becoming a geologian, you have, you're in the wrong century. <laughs> you're out of date. Um, so he sees himself and he sees theology, geo, you know, geologian theology, as being the necessity to become a passionate defender of what he would say is the holy fact of the earth. But what he says is that he caught sight as a young boy, <clears throat> I think he was about 12, um, he glimpsed a spring meadow across a creek, just almost like out of the corner of his eye, in passing, but this left an indelible impression on him. It was, he says, just a meadow in early afternoon May light. It happened to be covered with white lilies that rose above the grass. And it was also the cricket song, and it was the clouds in the sky. It was very bright at that time. Nothing particularly conscious happened. It was just a boy glancing across to a nearby field. This is him speaking. Yet, as the years pass, I seem to come back to this moment and the impact it has had on my feeling for what is real and worthwhile in life. Whatever preserves and enhances this meadow in the natural cycles of its transformation is good. What is opposed to this meadow or negates it in any fashion is not good. My life orientation is that simple. It is also that pervades it. And I think that in a sense this is a beginning of the way of seeing it too, which we'll look into in the second part of the day, afternoon, of seeing into this proposition that the whole earth, sometimes the character in the particular column is, could be translated as the whole universe or world. All of these are possible in the character, Chinese character concerned with this kind. The whole earth, the whole universe, the whole world <coughs> is medicine. You can begin to see some aspect of that in, in the way that that mere glimpse out of the you know, sidelong glance at a meadow blooming in ordinary, not that there's anything ordinary, in ordinary daylight in, in a childhood moment, how that could become, in a sense, the touchstone of the entire life um, as to what is good, as in are uh, supportive of life, congruent with life, congruent with the deepest part of us, um, good, and what is not good. So what could damage or not sustain the natural life, ongoing transformation of that meadow? Not good. <coughs> and what sustains it and protects it and is steward is like a steward towards it. That is good. So so that's Thomas Berry and here's what the <coughs> Texas Cattleman <coughs> resolution um, in 1898, a meeting of cattlemen in West Texas on, on what was the first day? Really one of the most um, productive grasslands on earth, beautiful uh, grasslands for animals to live on. And clearly this is at a moment when um, the forces of uh, open open range grazing and, and uh, you know, the, the cattleman versus the sheep, it is, we know the story because we've all seen Western, so I presume. Um, this was their resolution recorded. This is the declaration they resolved at their meeting. Resolved that none of us know or care to know anything about grasses, native or otherwise, outside the fact that for the present there are lots of them, the best on record, and we are after getting the most out of them while they last. <laughs> So put those together, and that's, we live between those two extremes. Um, 
And we have to rediscover what you might almost call the healing potential in crisis. You know, there's a sense of crisis being, having the potential of being a healing crisis in consciousness, you know? Crisis takes us to the point that is just beyond what we think we know. It invites us, in fact, it pulls us into the unknown. And I want to argue, more than argue, you know, I want to kind of validate and by exploring the possibility that the kind of unknowing that we're being drawn into by the crisis we're in right now is in fact um, the most fertile source of creative energy in, that human beings can discover. The possibility of kind of, in a way, seeing that the frame in which we have viewed the Earth the exploitative, um, ransacking kind of frame. I mean, any child knows that it can't last. A child, a six-year-old child, if you explain, here's the earth, it's this size, um, and here's the unlimited idea of growth. Do they match up? No, they don't. You can't have a, a, a finite earth and an infinite appetite for growth. But an adult can grow into an accommodation of that complete incongruity. Daily life asks us of us. Um, paying the mortgage asks it of us, and so on. Looking after our children asks it of us. And so what a six-year-old can understand, um, someone in their mid-30s doesn't have time to think about that. And this is, this is how we grow into a kind of dangerous state of incongruity, of being present just as if we're not quite here, and of living a small distance off from our lives for safety's sake, almost for safety's sake. I just want to explore a little bit more. I'm just wondering how much time I should allow them um, to go from here. We're going to have a 20 minute break for afternoon tea. Mm -hmm. well, so you can, we can, can we finish? Um, well, it doesn't matter really. We can be flexible. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's many more things I could explore about the nature of the, the crisis we're in, and the, particularly the place of fear within it. Um, from one point of view, you know, fear has a great place here in this matter. If we, if we can't feel the danger we're in, it's a little like the boiling frog scenario. We, we actually continually adjust, we ignore the call to action. Fear is an alert. Life is in danger. It's a call to action. And it's a call to first play very, pay very close attention. It's also possible to, in a sense, we have to put fear into its right place. Um, according to a theorist called Antonio Garreton, there are two archetypal childhood fears which are interesting to help us understand how we are responding and not responding. The first is what he calls fear of the dog that bites. Now, <clears throat> with the dog that bites, um, a child can actually learn to see it, that's a dog that might bite, learn how to handle it, um, learn how to kind of manage the sudden frightening fact that it's right in front of you. And of course the dog that bites could be a catastrophic weather event, it could be a firestorm, it could be um, uh, as well as being a dog that bites. <laughs> okay, so that's the immediate and possible immediate response sort of relationship to fear. The other fear, child archetypal childhood fear, he says, is fear of the darkened room. This is a much more generalised threat of the unknown. It's the place where something bad might be waiting for you. It's the place that can be filled with all kinds of fear and suggestibility. Um, I think right now, politically, we are being manipulated strongly by fear mm -hmm. and being told, you know, that. 
deadly, evil, deathly, etc. things in the world that um, you know, we must be frightened, very, very frightened of. Security and fear are so sort of strangely interlinked in the sense that the more secure we try to make ourselves, in a way the more imprisoned we are by fear. And to be able to open to the unknown, to with unknowing, then the, the darkened room might be a very interesting place because we can't yet see what's in it. We can't know yet what's in it. We can, in fact, um, feel our way into it, um, grow our way, almost like grow dark adapted eyes, eyes that are willing to look into a place where you can't yet see clearly and continue looking and continue growing into the questions that are posed by that impossible to completely discern sort of place. Because in the darkened room you can't, that you can't see into, there's not just every imaginable terror there, but also the saving grace and the power of becoming able and equal to facing the fear of the unknown, to relying, in fact, on uncertainty. It might seem strange to say that, but I think we can learn to rely on uncertainty rather than hope to establish certainties at every point. I hope I can show you more of that in the afternoon, in the second stage of this afternoon. Because in a way that's like relying on what is happening rather than what we wish was happening. To rely on what is happening that is forever, in some measure, going to be the mysterious, the inconceivable, the unknown. Um, you know, in a sense, our, the deepest part of ourselves is also unknown. We are unknown beings, you know. That's actually the basis for love. The fact that we are, in a sense, at every point, facing the unknown when, when we are in the presence of love. We are extending ourselves into the unknown. We are offering ourselves not to kind of certainty, but honouring the unknownness, the depthlessness of, of, you know, the unfathomability of other beings. I want to really argue, you know, strongly for this possibility of offering ourselves to the unknown. That is what this crisis is really making inevitable. Um, it's making it, well, to paraphrase my subtitle, it's the offer we can no longer refuse. We have the strange situation where the very thing that we use to make us as um, safe as possible, we hope, is everything that comes from this strong form of fossil fuel energy, you know, power, connectedness of, of an electric, electronic and electric kind. Um, <clears throat> power to fly around the planet, power to drive cars to come here, power to um, heat our homes and, and to create our clothes, and because you know, all of this now the basis of almost every pharmaceutical, clothing, furniture, art, a building, and so on. It is so drawn into every part of our lives. At the same time, that is the very thing that is most threatening to our security. The very thing we dream of and draw to ourselves to make ourselves secure. Perhaps I'll end with this as a really quite a team. The American poet, Robert Hess, uh, well, he, for a while he was the um, Poet Laureate of America. And this is a, a wonderful thing he said, and at first when you listen to it, you might feel a little startled and concerned, but let's look more deeply. He says this, we are the only protectors, and we are the thing that needs to be protected. And we are what it needs to be protected from. So immediately, I'll, I'll read it again. Because we are the only protectors. And we are the thing that needs to be protected. And we are what it needs to be protected from. 
Now, from one point of view, that's very almost like an Escher mm -hmm. drawing of endlessly mm -hmm. climbing and, and never getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. Another point of view is saying no one can possibly be outside this concern, this matter. Mm -hmm. At every, from every angle, it's us. Mm -hmm. And from another point of view, you can almost glimpse in that, I think. Um, <clears throat> a kind of mutually interactive or dynamic set of realizations emerge. They create something more like what an ecology looks like, where everything in, in an ecological system implies everything else in it, and is in a state at its best of harmonic balance with all the other contending needs and forces and, and life forms in that ecological agreement that is constructed formed over time in the most, I think, miraculous fashion. So it suddenly sounds awfully like a description of a kind of ecological time, ecological possibility, of ways of the way to see our crisis. It is an ecological crisis. It is an environmental, notice the word mental, an environmental crisis. And it is, in a sense, the very image of how we need to learn to move, how we need to learn to address each other in a communion of subjects with the earth, how we included in that, and how we then can understand, come to understand, the actual terms of the earth, which I would say many older indigenous pre uh, pre-urban and pre-agricultural societies knew a great deal more about than we have agreed to remember. But it's not lost. We are all, we are all indigenous. We're all born right here on this planet. So I would say that the Earth never ever stops holding up its side of the conversation with us. It's just us who lost the etiquette holding that conversation with you. Probably we can get it back. So I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.